Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for a special webinar on marathon and half marathon training. I'm Varun Sriram with Generation UCAN and absolutely thrilled to be co-hosting this today with none other than Coach Greg McMillan. Greg, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Varun. Good to be here with you. Looking forward to uh, the discussion over the next hour or so. And uh, Greg, we're, we're really going to cover uh, a lot, as folks can see on the screen here. You're going to walk us through the grade eight, which are really your uh, you know proven important factors for half marathon and uh, full marathon success. So uh, you're, you're going to take us through those, uh, those eight different uh, aspects of marathon training that we should focus on. And, and this is really going to cover a, a whole bunch of different things from, from different types of workouts to fueling. Uh, so really going to get a comprehensive look uh, from you, Greg. And then and certainly um, towards the end, as we talk about fueling, we're also going to in detail talk about Generation UCAN, what the products are all about, and, and how they can uniquely help uh, a lot of runners bypass um, some common issues that they face when it comes to fueling for distance and fueling for marathons. So before we get really into all of that and the meat of our presentation, uh, Greg, maybe you could just take a couple minutes to talk about your background in the sport of running. Uh, you, you know, you've had the, uh, the good fortune to be involved in a lot of different elements of the sport and, and bring that unique perspective to your coaching. Uh, but, but tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your involvement in the sport of running. Well, I've been really lucky. Uh, I started running at a young age and really fell in love with the sport in high school uh, and was lucky to be a state champion in high school. Uh, so really not only loved it, but was successful at it, transitioned from that into running in college and then competing after college and then was even Masters National Champion in the Trail Marathon when I turned 40. And I've run New York City and Boston and a whole bunch of races, so I'm sort of eat up with it, if you will. I just, I love the sport and what it does for us physically and mentally. Uh, and, and so that's, I come at the sport from, from one angle, which is as being a runner, still running myself and competitive. I also uh, wanted to study the sport. I fell in love with it so much in high school. So I studied exercise physiology. I got a master's degree in exercise physiology where my research focused on the factors leading to endurance performance. And so I've sort of was always interested in how can we get better? How can every athlete get a little bit better? And while I was doing that research, that sort of formed the basis of what became the McMillan running calculator that a lot of people have used to know exactly what paces they should use for each workout they do or run and then predict their race times and that's on my website mcmillanrunning.com you can go there and use it and find out information about yourself and I also come to the sport you know as a coach I've been very very fortunate to be mentored by some of the world's greatest coaches from Arthur Lydiard that you see there on the left to Joe V. Hill there in the middle and even studying some of the international types of training like the Japanese system uh, from Nabi Hashizumi that you see on the right and Dr. David Martin who worked with USA Track and Field for a long time really around some amazing coaches got several certifications in coaching and so I kinda come at the sport from those three angles when I work with athletes, uh, from being a runner, uh, applying exercise physiology, and learning from these great people. And I've been so fortunate that in my coaching career, I've worked with the full spectrum of runners. I get to work with new athletes who are just coming off the couch or out from behind the computer, getting going in the sport. I've coached charity marathon groups. Lots of age group athletes trying to improve, run new PRs and break time barriers. A ton of athletes that qualify for the Boston Marathon. In fact, we had 252 McMillan athletes in Boston just this year. So a lot, helping lots of athletes achieve that goal. And then even athletes that have been national champions and even Olympians like you see there on the right. Uh, so really fun for me to be able to work with the full spectrum of runners and I think because I work with all types of runners it really helps me with each runner to figure them out to figure out what's unique and how uh, I can help that individual athlete optimize their training for their greatest success. 
Greg, as you've done this over the years and worked with a, a host of runners and, you know, been a runner and experienced a lot of these um, yourself, uh, you know, you've, you've been able to develop uh, what you call the grade eight, which are your factors for half and full marathon success. So I'm really going to turn it over to you right now, Greg, and let you take us through uh, the grade eight and um, identify these different factors and, and talk through them. And then I'll hop back on with you um, in a little bit and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the fueling aspect of it and how it relates to Generation UK and nutrition. So uh, so with that, Greg, uh, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thanks. Well, I want to dive in deep here. I want to give you as much information as you can on these factors that we've found just are so important to success at longer distance races. And I think it's consistent across the board that if, if you're planning to run a half marathon or a full marathon, as we walk through these different factors, if you make a note and you can kind of follow each of these, you really give yourself a great chance of success. So with that said, let's dive in. The first one is consistent mileage. You really increase your chance of success if you're consistent in your mileage across your training plan. Uh, what this does, of course, is it builds up this well of physical and mental strength that you can draw on in your race. Uh, the race is going to be difficult. It's going to challenge you mentally and physically. And if you have this consistent mileage base, you hear experienced runners always talking about a base. It's this base of mileage that allows you, that you can draw from when you need it. Of course, the question that I always get is, well, how much mileage do I need to run to complete a half marathon or a full marathon? Or how much mileage do I need to run to break four hours in the marathon? The answer, unfortunately, is it depends. It really depends on your experience in the sport. If you've been running for a while and you've maintained a decent mileage level for a long time, then obviously you can run different levels. If you have an injury history, so you're frequently injured, well, that informs it as well that maybe we need to lower the mileage so we can stay consistent and not be injured. Another big factor for a lot of people is their, their schedule is jam-packed, so do you have time to train? How much time availability do you have to even train? Because it's one thing to, to look at a training schedule and say, that's the one I want to do, but if it doesn't fit into your life, that's going to be a challenge. You also have to look at your life stress level. That really informs how much mileage you should do because, again, it's all one stress pie. We want to make sure that it can fit into your life. So what I advise people to do is look at training plans and find one that looks like it's very doable. In other words, when you look at it, you think, well, I've got a high probability that I can get all of this in. It won't stress my time availability. It'll keep me healthy. It'll fit into my life schedule because inevitably something's going to go wrong uh, just when I don't want it to. And so you've got to have enough wiggle room in the plan so that you're not training at 100%, that you need everything in your work life to go perfect, in your family life to go perfect, to get the training in. So there's a lot of factors that go into how much mileage you should run. But when you kind of dial in the number of days per week that you can run and the amount of time you have, then really I've broken it into there's three kind of strategies, if you will, for runners. And the first is if you're new to half marathon training and full marathon, the idea is you want a smooth increase in your mileage across the plan. And in this example I'm using, this is of a runner who runs three days a week, about five miles. So 15 total miles is where uh, she'd be starting this uh, training plan. And what you can see is this nice smooth increase where she's just building up mileage and most of that coming from an addition, you know, the long runs getting longer. She may even add a day of running. And then you'll see every fourth week or third week, there's a down week, this decreased week where we let the body catch up. And a down week is really a week where you just reduce your total running by 10 to 40%. And what that does is it kind of allows the body to catch up so you don't have too much accumulating fatigue, particularly in the musculoskeletal system, because that's what gets injured in runners. 
is the musculoskeletal system. So when you look at this plan, you can see that she's just building up for two or three weeks and then she's got a down week where she can recover. And then building up again, down, building up again, down, building up again, and then dropping down to peak for the race. So across this plan, we've got she's probably going to double her mileage so for new runners who aren't running that much that's very doable if they're smart and gradual across their plan like we see here now the challenge of course is that a lot of people follow the next slide which is where on the left side, you know you see again the same starting point of 15 miles per week and then you know a couple of weeks are good and then a really down week and then jumping back into the plan and uh, boosting the mileage way up and then dropping down again and then a big increase and it's just not as smooth you can see the difference between the two plans on the left and the right so there's too large of drops and increases it's not really a smooth change for new runners we'd really like them to to train at a level that's very doable and they're smoothly uh, building their mileage. Now for intermediate runners, the next slide, uh, what we see is again we like to take those down weeks every third or fourth week. But you'll also notice that the bulk of the higher mileage is really coming in the last few weeks, the last half of that training schedule. Since an intermediate runner typically is already doing decent mileage, this runner runs 30 to 40 miles per week regularly, then we're going to boost that mileage and, and she'll increase her mileage as the marathon gets closer. Again, most of that coming from the longer runs that she'll have to do and longer workouts. Uh, she'll get more mileage, maybe even peaking out at 50 miles per week. Uh, but again, having those down weeks uh, and then tapering down into the race. That works really well for intermediate runners. No reason to chase too much mileage, but you'll probably find that you get an increase in mileage across the plan. And again, every runner will be slightly different. Uh, now advanced runners, as you see here, they're already doing a lot of mileage typically, and so they don't need a huge increase in mileage to get ready for a half or a full marathon. And again, you'll notice we've really shoved most of the big increase is later in the training plan. So the last few weeks is where the heaviest training is. And I always tell this type of runner, you only want to push the envelope in your volume and intensity, your heaviest training, for only a few weeks. If you try to do that for the entire 16-week plan, that would be too much. It has a high likelihood that you're going to have an injury or you're just going to get burned out. So again, we've got the new runner is probably having a faster and more sort of consistent increase in volume across the plan, whereas the, the intermediate runner has increases but maybe shoved a little bit closer to the end of the plan, and then the, the advanced runner you know again kind of later in the plan but they're not chasing they're not doubling their mileage like the new runner was they already have decent mileage so my goal key number one is make sure your mileage goals fit your life and build in some wiggle room because stuff is gonna happen it always does and you'll get stressed if you start feeling like you're missing your training uh, because life has happened and your schedule is just too compressed uh, and don't increase too fast as you saw in those other programs even for the new runner we were gradually building the mileage over time and we were taking those down weeks every third or fourth week I really like those down weeks you know it's been interesting in our coaching program at McMillan running the average injury rate in the running population depending on the survey you look at is about 60 to 70 percent of runners are getting injured in their training plans and we calculated our injury rate at nine percent so we have an 80 percent reduction in injuries using our training and I think a big part of that is that we make it fit their life and we take these down weeks so they never have too much accumulating fatigue so again our our focus is not on the challenge of any one run or one training week we're really looking at consistency think about your mileage across your training plan as a body of work 
the average across that. I just want to get consistently lots and lots of good training in without having any interruptions or wild peaks and valleys. And I always tell people, follow a plan. Don't just wing it. You need to have a plan. So find a training plan that fits you and follow it. If you're just winging it, there's too many times when you'll make a subjective or an emotional decision that may not be the best with this sort of long-term view of consistency over time. So key number one, consistent and smart mileage across your training plan. If you can do that, uh, you have a high chance of success. Now our next one is related to the long run and everybody knows if you're getting ready for a half marathon or a full marathon, you've got to do long runs and we really recommend uh, two types of long runs. One is kind of the steady long run. This is the long run that most of us do every week where you're just going out and you're running for, for a duration, but you're not worried so much about your pace. You're not pushing the pace. It's conversational pace. Uh, and then the other one is a fast finish long run. I'll talk about that in a second. And again, on the right, you see I've got an article on our website, mcmillanrunning.com talks more in depth about these long runs so you can go and check that out uh, and it'll talk in you know at length about the steady long run and these fast finish long runs so number two is let's look at how you respond and recover from these steady long runs and the long run really took hold and people started to see big benefits from it from Arthur Lydiard who I'm there with on the right hand side when we toured together on his last tour of the US and he talked about the long runs these sort of just going out and getting your duration in developing what he called the tireless state and if you've been a runner for very long and trained for any races you know that in the beginning some of these long runs you just feel so fatigued from them but later in the plan after you do a few you can just run and run and run and we see that right if you go run with your buddies and you're talking the whole time and suddenly two hours has gone by so you reach this sort of tireless state physically and mentally where you really uh, have great endurance you also improve your energy systems this helps you reduce how much fuel you're burning as you're running and that saves that fuel for later which is what we definitely want in the races and runners also know they've experienced boy across the plan I start to recover quicker and quicker from these long runs the first few always takes me two or three days before my body and mind feel kind of reinvigorated to go back out there and train but later in the training plan I feel ready in one or two days uh, and again, all that time on your feet builds stronger and stronger legs and strong legs really help you get ready for the marathon. Now one question I constantly get when talking about these um, steady long runs is, well how long should the longest run be, say for the marathon? So I'll tell you exactly what we do in our training is that, uh, and we build slowly to this, you can see this in the next slide we build slowly to this level over two to three months. Uh, for our fast marathoners, for those of you who are running say sub three hour pace, we like to build that maximum long run to equivalent to the marathon time or the marathon time plus 30 to 45 minutes. So here's an example which may show you what I mean. So if we have a three hour and 45 minute marathon we're going to build that athlete up to their longest long run should last between two hours and 45 minutes and three hours and 30 minutes. So marathon time to their marathon time plus 30 to 45 minutes. That's a great zone for the longest run for faster marathoners. Now if you're more in the plus or minus four hour range, then the maximum long run we like is a little bit shorter than your marathon time, so marathon time minus 15 to 30 minutes, all the way up to your marathon time plus 15 to 30 minutes. So simple example, if, you have, if you're a four hour marathoner, then your longest long run might be between three and a half hours and four and a half hours. So again, marathon time minus 30 minutes up to marathon time plus 30 minutes. Uh, and then if for runners who are more in the plus or minus five to six hours, 
uh, we change it again. We think the maximum long run should be less than the duration of their marathon. We typically don't have those marathoners going out for five or six hour long runs. We like to keep them a little bit more in the four to four and a half hour range. Again, we feel like that gets them long enough to get the stimulus that they will need to know they can push through to the end of their race but it doesn't beat them up so much because we're more concerned about you getting to the starting line. If you can get to the starting line, you have a high, success, high likelihood of getting to the finish line. If you can't get to the starting line, obviously you can't get to the finish line. And if you get to the starting line injured, it reduces your chance of success on the day. So those longer uh, marath marathons are going to take a little bit longer. We kind of keep those long runs a little bit shorter. And again, these are by time and not by mileage. Again, that would vary based on the pace, the minutes uh, per mile that the athlete is running. But that's a good zone we found really good success with for your longest long run. So that's another component. If you can get in those longest, if you can re recover from those longer long runs uh, better and better across the plan you've got a great chance of success. Now the second type of long run, which is number three in our list here, is the physical and mental ability in what we call the fast finish long runs. And lots of pro athletes do these long runs and have for years. Now these are shorter long runs. They're not as long as the ones we just talked about. They typically only build to about three quarters of your race time. So for example, for our four hour marathoner, she might get this fast finish long run. Her fast finish long run would last three hours, if that makes sense. Now, how do you do a fast finish long run? Uh, you start at your normal sort of easy running pace. And then after a few miles, you dial in your goal pace and you get several miles in at your goal pace, sort of in the sort of middle of that run, you're trying to be around goal pace. But then in the last one to three miles from the finish of that run, you run as hard as you can. You empty the tanks, you blow it all out, you push yourself as hard as you can for those last one to three miles. It's, uh, these runs are really challenging mentally and physically, but they give you a chance uh, to challenge yourself that way, but also to practice your equipment. We tell athletes, wear what you're going to wear in the race. Practice your nutrition plan, what you're going to have the night before, what you're going to have the morning of, what time of day are you going to be running. Practice all of that. And again, on the website, you can go to the learn section, and there's a whole bunch of videos in there, and there's a video exactly on this, how to do these types of long runs. So you can check that out on my website as well. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that what you'll find over time is that your average pace for these long run, these fast finish long runs will increase. And most of that comes from you're able to get into marathon goal pace a little bit earlier in the run and you actually feels the running feels easier at marathon pace, which is a really good uh, scenario and if you're doing this for the half marathon you mimic the same thing it would feel easier at half marathon pace you also find that you can push yourself faster for the last one to two miles and that is a very good sign that you're getting race ready when you're willing to push yourself when you're willing to suffer and push when you are suffering that is a really good sign that you're ready to race and I know we love every race to feel amazing and like we're running on air and we never even sweat. But the fact is, most of us know that's not the case. You have to be willing to push. If you're willing to push when you're tired, that's a very good sign for success. Now you can't do this type of run all the time. These are extremely stressful runs. So you only do two to four of those in the last eight weeks. And I put a little schematic there on the right of how we often would schedule it. And these are the last eight weeks of a marathon plan, the long run type each week. And you see long steady run, the first type that we talked about. Week 10, we do the first fast finish long run. So we're six weeks out from the race. 
we get one of those in. Two weeks later, do it again. Two weeks later, do it again. You've got three right there. And what we typically find is the first one is really challenging because you don't exactly know what to feel. And then the second and third is where you really start to be able to push when you're tired and your pace gets better. Uh, and then you kind of rest up for the race. And this is a, a really challenging run, but I do it even with new runners because new runners are out there for a long time and maybe they don't have as much experience with racing at shorter distances and their mind isn't really as comfortable with feeling so much fatigue and suffering. So we want to mimic that a few times, not all the time, but a few times in the marathon and half marathon plan. Typically what we find is that fixes the fade. And if you run a marathon before, you know that there's a big fade that can happen at the end where the last few miles of the marathon and the half marathon, you tend to slow down. These fast finish long runs are very good at fixing that fade. So if that's an issue that you have is keeping going and having a lot of power at the end of runs, uh, races, then put in those fast finish long runs. When people do that and they really start to nail the fast finish long run, I feel really confident that they're going to have a great race. Now moving to number four on the list, uh, this is do some fast running. So one of the things that can happen when athletes are training for a half marathon or a full marathon is that their pace range gets really narrow. They're basically running between their easy run pace and maybe their marathon pace. And they do a lot, a lot of training in that zone. And it makes sense, obviously. That's specific for the type of event they're training for. But we find if you put in some fast running, it doesn't have to be all the time, but once every two to three weeks uh, for new runners and intermediate runners and a little more frequently for more advanced runners, uh, this fast running, and it can be things as, as like strides or what we would call a leg speed workout where you're just picking up the pace for 15 to 20 seconds and then slowing down for a minute or so and repeating that or, or a run where you might change pace of one minute fast, one minute slow and alternate that 10 to 15 times or even more traditional track work that runners do. This helps maintain athlete stride length because one of the things that can happen if your pace range gets real narrow and you're never really stretching out your stride, your body says, great, I will just operate in this zone. And we see a lot of people, their stride gets shorter and shorter and particularly as they age and suddenly they can't even go fast anymore because they don't have that ability to increase their stride. So this fast running we find really helps them increase their stride. It also builds their aerobic capacity, or people may have heard of VO2 max, builds that aerobic capacity. It also builds their running economy. So one of the things you want to do as a half and full marathoner is you want to be very economical. You want to burn very little fuel as you're running. And this faster running actually helps improve that running economy that can help you in your long, uh, long distance race pace as well. And it's also kind of fun to get out there and do something faster. And these are usually shorter and uh, repetition type workouts. And so instead of sort of the long steady stuff and continuous running people have been doing, these fast workouts are a lot of fun. Now one of the ones that I like, uh, you'll see it on the next slide, uh, is the Yasso 800s and Bart Yasso who is at Runner's World kind of made this workout famous and I've really included it in most of the marathon plans just because I think it's a great workout. I think it's a challenging workout for athletes mentally and physically. It definitely breaks up the sort of long training monotony and it's also a predictor workout and, and if you haven't heard of Yasso 800s here's the way it goes. You build up to doing 10 times 800 meters or half mile in the minutes and seconds of your intended hours and minutes of your goal race with equal recovery. And this is for the marathon. So the example is if you wanted to run three hours and 45 minutes for your marathon, then you would build up starting at maybe six repeats one week and then maybe three weeks later you do eight repeats and then maybe six or four or six weeks out from your race you'd be able to do 10 in 3 minutes and 45 seconds and you take equal recovery. 
So you take three minutes and 45 seconds recovery jog. Again, you got to build up to this. Um, only advanced runners may start at sort of eight to 10 of those repetitions. Most of us would start more with four to six times 800 and then six to eight and build up that way. It's a very strong VO2 max workout and it's really a mental toughness workout because it's going to be difficult. It's a big volume of fast running. But it's pretty predictive. So if you can go out and you can accomplish the 10 times 800 in your uh, the time that fits what you want to run, then we find that's pretty predictive. And we, we kind of even dial it in a little bit more. If you're an endurance monster, and we call that type of runner the one that's so much better at the longer races and not very good at the shorter races, really loves long continuous workouts, more mileage, but really doesn't like the short races and repetition workouts. For that person, it's pretty much dead on that whatever you can average for those 10 repetitions is what you'll be able to run in the marathon. Again, using that three hours, 45 minutes versus three minutes, 45 seconds idea. If you're a combo runner, which is most of us where we're sort of equally good at you know everything then it's about two to four minutes fast so if you were uh, able to do those in three minutes and 45 seconds for your 10 and you're a combo runner it's probably going to predict about three minutes 47 to 349 for the marathon and then some of us we're speedsters so we're not really designed for the longer races we really prefer the shorter races shorter workouts uh, we typically can perform really well in this particular workout because it is a speed workout we find that you've got to add about three to five minutes onto that so again for our example runner uh, three minutes and 45 seconds if I could average that for 10 of these repetitions for me I'm probably going to be 348 to 350 would be the prediction from that workout but again it doesn't really matter it just kind of gives a little bit of a clue uh, into what you can do, but mostly I think it's just getting you fast. It's getting you out of that narrow pace range so you can challenge yourself. So that might be a fun workout uh, that you can put into your program. And if you can do that, if you do some fast running, tends to lead to success. Now number five, tune-up races. Uh, a lot of people like to do tune-up races within their training as they build up toward their big race and I think it provides a really fun break from training. Training can become monotonous uh, and so every now and then you need something that just sort of takes you out of the training mode and breaks it up. Uh, it can also be a great predictor of race time. That's one of the things the McMillan running calculator uh, does and you may not be able to see the exact times on the right but this is an output from a woman that I'm working with who's getting ready for the Chicago Marathon. And she just did a half marathon, which is highlighted there in the gray box, in an hour and 55 minutes and 27 seconds over a kind of hilly course. And that predicts a four hour and two minute and 58 second marathon. Uh, she wants to break four hours in Chicago. And so given that the half marathon was on a hilly course and Chicago is obviously not a hilly course, we feel really good here as we sit August 18th that by, we, by the time we get to Chicago in October, she's going to be in that sort of sub four hour shape. So that's nice that we have that in our back pocket. It builds her confidence. She feels good. I also like to do some tune-up races because, you know, the marathon, you just can't control everything. And if you, if you just put all your eggs in that basket, and then what if you show up and it's really hot or uh, something else happens out of your control, you might feel like, wow, I wasted all of that time. But if you've got these tune-up races, I mean, she can already feel great because that's a, PR, a personal best for her. So she feels like she got something out of this training um, plan anyway. So I always like that as well. And uh, if you join our run club, which we'll talk, I think we'll, you can get information on the website about it. We have an online training community called Run Club and I do regular live coach chats there and uh, do a full video on this idea of tune-up races, how to do them, how to insert them, but I think they're a lot of fun and uh, you might consider that as you uh, go across your plan and like I said, 
the way I use it typically is do a race. We put it in the calculator and that kind of gives us an idea of how close we're getting to our goal time. So it's another important factor for us. Uh, now number six is a really important one because it's not just physical stuff, it's mental stuff. And uh, emotional control is really important in these longer races. And if you've done any short races, there's always these crazy people that go super fast in the beginning and you know they're just going to get really tired and you're going to pass them. And in the longer races, it's even more important that you exhibit emotional control. You control yourself early in the race so you don't go too fast. Uh, I think this is a picture of Desiree Linden. This was from the Olympic Marathon Trials in Los Angeles. Obviously, she just ran the Olympic Marathon and was seventh there. She came from behind in the trials here to make the team. I think she just really embodies this idea of emotional control. She knew what her game plan was. She knew how she could run the race. She didn't react to other people and kind of get caught up into what they're doing. It's kind of like us if we're on a pace group and the pace group's starting to go too fast. We have to be have that control where we can back off and run our own race. Uh, mentally, you also have a, a ton of mental toughness. We've talked about that in some of these other factors above where they're developing mental toughness. The more mentally tough you can be, the more willing you can be to suffer and sort of keep pushing even when you suffer, avoiding those pity parties that are way too common in these longer races gives you a great chance of success. And I always, as I'm working with runners, I'm calculating this LOD. It's the, the level of determination. And I'm, I'm sort of getting a sense of what's this athlete's level of determination. And you get that from all this stuff that's above. Uh, whenever they're challenged with longer runs or races or fast runnings or workouts that are going to be hard, what's their level of determination? Are they, are they willing to keep going even when they're tired? Uh, now, they, they, don't, they shouldn't keep going if they're feeling pain, not mental pain, but physical pain. They don't want to injure themselves. But if they need to complete 10 of those Yasso 800s and they don't have a pity party and they, they're able to push through and get the job done, I feel like that's a high level of determination. That's another important factor for success in these longer races. The next one is pace practice. It's really important that you groove your goal pace. You should not go into these longer races not having a sense that you could essentially put the watch away and dial in pretty close to your goal pace. Uh, it's really important because our body gets more economical at the paces we run. So the more pace practice that you do, the more improvement in economy at that race pace, something we, we definitely want. And we've talked about the pace practice before in the fast finish long runs. Uh, typically, when you do get improved running economy and you get really comfortable running at your goal pace, that makes you faster. It means that you've got more reserve energy for when you do get fatigued from the duration. Of course, you need to do this pace practice on similar terrain and similar conditions, if you can, as your race. So, for example, we had all those athletes running the Boston Marathon this year. Obviously, they weren't doing their pace practice runs on completely flat terrain. We were encouraging them, find terrain where it's rolling downhill. Get ready for Boston so you know the effort levels, how they change on uphills and downhills. Really important. And you start short with these. You don't have to go out and run, you know, three quarters of your race distance at your goal pace the first time out. Start short. Maybe even do it as repetitions. I'm going to do three times two miles at my marathon pace and take a short recovery in between and then build up to where you're doing longer and longer and more and more continuous. Uh, obviously, you can do this part of the fast finish long run. I like to do that. Remember that middle part of the fast finish long run was at your goal pace and so that gives you a great chance to get in some goal pace running. Or you can even do specific workouts. We'll do this sometimes where midweek for a marathoner, we might say, go out and run seven miles at your marathon pace. Uh, or run 10 miles, run three miles easy, and then the last seven at your marathon pace. You can do lots of different things to get in more pace practice. Speaking of races, uh, like we talked about a couple of uh, 
uh, slides ago, you can also enter races and use those to build up uh, to practice your pace. So if you're getting ready for a half marathon, you can enter a 10K. And don't race the 10K all out. Do it at your half marathon race pace. You get all this practice of warming up and taking your fluids and all that sort of thing. We see this a lot in the full marathon where athletes will run a half marathon uh, within their program at their marathon pace. It's a fun way to do an event. Plus you've got all the course support, you can practice your nutrition. It's just a fun way to kind of, you know, not always be training um, kind of alone, if you will, or at least not in race conditions. So practice that pace. The more you can get comfortable at race pace, that's another factor for success. And then our last one of the great eight is that athletes who are successful at their half and full marathon, they typically have a successful and well-practiced fueling plan. You're going to have to fuel in these longer races to keep your brain happy and fueling the working muscles. We know from neuroscience and exercise physiology that you just, you're going to have to provide a little bit of fuel along the way to keep your brain happy. And if your brain's happy, it'll keep saying, let's go, let's push. When it gets unhappy, uh, that's where pity parties happen and the big slowdown. And we know this, right? If you get hungry, you're grumpy. So you wouldn't want to be grumpy while you're trying to challenge yourself in a race. So keeping the brain happy with fueling is important. And then the working muscles pull some of that fuel uh, themselves. Obviously, this is something that's very individual. You have to experiment in training to find what works for you. And for most athletes, it's really a balance between they need to fuel themselves, but you can't just overfuel or else you get GI distress. And if there's any runners out there listening that have done many races, you probably have experienced the GI distress where you've tried to fuel as much as you can, but the stomach just says, cries uncle and says, I can't do that. Um, what we're really going for is to fuel in a way that you can have high energy levels, mental energy levels, and lots of physical power over the last 10K of the marathon or the last 5K of a half marathon. If that's where the magic happens, because most people can run their goal pace through halfway or three quarters of these races. It's usually in the last portion that they really slow down. They may even bonk and hit the wall. But if we can go into that and have a lot of power, a lot of mental energy, a mental excitement to get through that last portion, you typically will run very well. And one of the things that's great, of course, is that you're passing all those people who are not having a great day. And that just makes you feel so good as you're, you feel like you're really flying down the course and that gives you even more motivation to keep going. So what we find a lot of times is most people, um, you know, they fuel early, but then their stomach starts to get a little upset and they stop fueling and then they fade late in the race. And so what we're trying to do is experiment so that you can get your fuel in, avoid the GI distress, have plenty of energy for late in the race. Uh, and that comes with experimentation. And then the last point there is that you got to have this as a plan. You can't go into the race not knowing I'm going to have this to drink at this time along the way. You can't just kind of take it as you feel. You really need to have a plan. Otherwise, you'll get behind in your fueling and then you'll try to play catch up and usually you can't. So have a great plan. Dial it in. Know exactly what you're going to have before and during that race all the way down to every X number of minutes I'm going to take in this, every X number of minutes or miles I'm going to take in this, and this is my strategy. Write it down exactly what I'm going to do. So I know that's a lot to cover in a short amount of time, but I wanted to go through this and sort of reiterate and maybe focus you in on these eight things. If you can get nail these in your training, I feel like you've got a great chance at success. So try to be consistent in your mileage. Take those down weeks, but have smooth trend in your mileage. Get to, do those long runs. Make sure you build up to that tireless state. 
practice those fast finish runs, really get good at pushing when you're tired. Do some fast running, those Yasso 800s are fun, but it can be any type of fast running. Include some of that so that you mix up your paces. Tune-up races, I like that for most athletes. I think that's fun to get out there. Again, it's predictive of your race performance. Just put it in the McMillan Running Calculator and tell you what your times will be for these long races. The emotional part, the, or part of it, the mental part of it, you get a lot of that uh, with all those other components, one through five, but it's really something that you want to know you're going to need a lot of in the race. You're going to be need to be tough. Uh, you're going to need to be under control in the beginning, tough at the end, be really determined. Practice that pace. Make sure that by the time the race comes, you feel very good that, hey, I can dial this in. I'm not going to pace incorrectly. I'm going to dial this in. I know exactly what pace I should be hitting. I know what it feels like. And then that successful fueling plan. And I know Varen can tell us more about uh, exactly how Generation U can can play into that but the point the bottom line is get a plan practice it so that you know exactly what works for you on race day there should be no surprises no GI distress and you should be fully powered across the entire race great stuff Greg well that, that, that was fantastic and uh, it, we covered a ton and I think that was really valuable um, but let's hone in uh, a little bit more on the nutrition side of things and I'll speak a little bit about um, Generation You Can, some of the science and the theory behind it, the, the story behind the products as well. Um, Craig, I'll give your lungs a rest for a couple of minutes, um, but definitely uh, we'll pull you back in as well to talk about what intrigued you about You Can, how you got introduced to it, and kind of what you've been seeing um, in your own running and with the athletes you coach. So with all of that, um, you know, with in terms of fueling, as runners, um, it's traditionally been, especially when it comes to the marathon and, and distance training, about fueling with sugars and fueling with these high glycemic, fast acting carbohydrates. So things like cereal, bagels, bananas, um, you know, your energy gels, your, your, your energy blocks, uh, sugar based energy bars. Th these are very, very common foods that you'll see at races and, and very common things that runners have traditionally consumed both before and, and during um, an endurance event or endurance training. And one of the, the issues with this fueling pattern is really the impact on your blood sugar levels. So anytime we consume a carbohydrate specifically, uh, it's going to impact our blood sugar levels in a different way. And, and when we talk about blood sugar, um, we can in a way view it to be synonymous to energy. When our blood sugar levels are very steady, our energy levels are very steady. We feel that evenness, um, you know, you, you can exercise and, and you don't feel those highs and lows, those, those ups and downs. And, and importantly, you feel like you can keep going. Now, a lot of these sugar-based or, or high glycemic carbohydrates, um, they cause the calories to enter our system very quickly. So, you know, for anybody that's consumed an energy gel and, and you know, you, you feel it as soon as you, you take it in, you feel that rush right away and you feel that sugar spike. But, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes later, when your blood sugar starts to drop, that's when you start to feel fatigue. That's when your body starts to produce certain stress hormones. Uh, when we talk about fatigue, you know, it's not just muscular fatigue, but even, even that brain fatigue. Greg talked about keeping your brain happy uh, when, when our glucose levels fluctuate. Uh, we get that brain fog or that that hazy feeling. So it's not certainly not ideal for performance and, and not ideal in terms of the way it makes us feel. And and then, uh, you know, one more thing, when, when our blood sugar is fluctuating, whether it's during exercise or even throughout the day, we start to feel hungry. So a lot of us can relate to that, you know, that feeling of hunger an hour into a workout or, or even that, that three o'clock feeling of hunger at work uh, when your blood sugar is low. It's not necessarily that your stomach's growling, but your blood sugar being lower, your blood sugar dropping can can cause you to reach for something sugary or, or, or just feel that sensation of hunger um, where you feel like you need to consume something right away. Um, and then another thing that occurs when we spike our sugars is we negatively impact our body's ability to break down and burn fat. And in distance running, you know, Greg's talked about this at, at length, um, really uh, it's about teaching your body to become more efficient at burning fat by keeping your blood sugar steady, which is going to allow you to feel 
stronger in the end of the race. So when Greg's talking about a lot of athletes fading towards the end of the race, all of these things are very tied into each other. You know, if, if you can't take in enough fuel because it's upsetting your stomach late in the race, then you could be more prone to bonking. If you're constantly fueling with sugars throughout your run and, and you're teaching your body to be very carbohydrate dependent and not very efficient at burning fat, then you need to take in more fuel throughout your exercise, throughout your race or your training. And, you know, that, that for a lot of folks can lead to these GI issues where they simply can't take in the fuel. So from a performance standpoint and, and from a fitness standpoint, if we can keep our blood sugar levels very even, we're going to get the best results, both in terms of how we feel, uh, how we perform and the fitness and body composition um, that we're able to achieve throughout the training period. Now, with a lot of your traditional sports nutrition fuels, uh, the, the carbohydrate that a lot of the newer products are using, um, and when I say the newer products, you know, your gel products, your, your, your chews, um, they're using a carbohydrate called maltodextrin. So initially, you know, when the, the first sports drinks came out, they were using simple sugars, sucrose, fructose, dec dextrose, excuse me. And, uh, and then, in the 90s, maltodextrin came on the market, and, and maltodextrin is a more complex carbohydrate than simple sugar. So the theory behind it was that it would be easier on the stomach. If, if a carbohydrate has a more complex structure, then in theory, it's going to digest uh, more easily and, and get it through the stomach more easily. So it won't cause some of that GI distress. But from a blood sugar standpoint, maltodextrin is a very fast-acting carbohydrate. It's designed to give you that quick burst of energy and give you that that sugar spike. And for any of you folks that have utilized the gel product before, you, you felt that. You know that it's designed to be taken in and, and give you that quick burst of energy. If we look at the graph on the screen though, the the downside of that is, you know, what comes up must go, what goes up must come down. And and you see it with the blue line, you see the big spike caused by maltodextrin. This is a 25 gram serving, which is roughly what you'd find in a typical gel product. And then about 30 minutes later on the x-axis, you see that big sharp drop. And for most people, when the blood sugar starts to drop around that 30 or 40 minute mark, that's a signal that you need to take in more fuel. Now, ideally, uh, the way we would want a carbohydrate to act in terms of supporting that energy maintenance over a long period of time, like the marathon or the half marathon, is something that breaks down very slowly and steadily over time and is able to maintain that steady and even blood sugar level. And that's really what the red line is showing. That red line that shows super starch um, is really showing an ideal way that a carbohydrate will act, giving you that slow and steady release and keeping your blood sugar steady over an extended period of time. So what we see with this super starch, which is the key ingredient in Generation You Can, which we'll, we'll talk about the origins here in a moment, but with the super starch, we see that same serving, a 25 gram serving, first of all, doesn't spike you in that big way like the maltodextrin does. But more importantly, the decline is very slow and steady over time. So you're never going to get that big crash. And, and if you look at this, uh, the x-axis, about 90 minutes to two hours later in terms of time, your blood sugar is still right around baseline, right around where it started. So the super starch is really able to give you that consistent and steady energy on an equivalent serving uh, compared to an equivalent serving of maltodextrin, the super starch is able to last you, you know, about two to three times as long because it's breaking down slowly and steadily over time. But, you know, and, and the, so like I mentioned, the super starch is really the key ingredient in UCAN products and it comes both in powdered format and in bar format. Uh, Greg, before I get into the origins, I'm just curious, um, when did UCAN and, and Super Starch really come on your radar? And uh, we've kind of set the scene a little bit in terms of what Super Starch does and, and how it's different. But what intrigued you, um, you know, as a coach and an exercise physiologist about UCAN? Well, it really started for me as the runner, where in my first few marathons, I used the traditional strategy that you use for fueling, and it just wasn't successful. I wasn't able to have sustained energy. I was really susceptible to the crash after taking in more of the fast acting, as you say, carbohydrates. And so I couldn't fuel enough to have enough energy because my gut got upset and then I was really susceptible to these spikes and crashes. And obviously as an exercise physiologist, I kind of knew what was going on. I knew, well, I'm flooding my system with carbohydrates and so the body's saying, well, we got to lower that blood glucose and then 
I would have that spike or the crash later and so I was looking for something um, that could maintain more of a, a steady energy as you mentioned and also something I didn't have to take as frequently because I felt like that might make my stomach a little happier and I heard about Generation U can so I immediately got some product and began to try it to see okay can this not only give me the energy that I want sort of this instead of the spike and the crash a little more steady feeling but also would it be easier on my stomach because nobody likes those bathroom breaks or, or just feeling so bad in your stomach that you, you don't fuel and you don't hydrate even though you know you should you can't because your stomach's so messed up so that's when I really started getting it and, and like most things I do practice on myself uh, see how does how does it work for me and and I found it to be very successful and thus have used it ever since so it's a great background, Greg, and, and you know what's intriguing about you can um, and, and kind of what intrigued me about it and, and for a lot of other folks, in addition to the science, it's kind of the story behind this super starch carbohydrate and what it was originally created for. So the slide on the screen shows our founder's son, Jonah, and Jonah suffers from a life-threatening blood sugar disease that basically causes uh, him to have life-threatening hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. So these kids with this condition, it's called glycogen storage disease, they're unable to break down carbohydrates and convert them into glucose to give them energy. So it's a catch-22. When they consume traditional carbohydrates, uh, they can't break them down, so that causes a host of issues. But if they don't consume carbohydrates, then they don't get glucose and they're unable to keep their blood sugar steady, their blood sugar drops, and that, that also creates a host of issues. So from the time that Jonah was born, um, his parents were actually feeding him uh, a small amount of cornstarch every 90 minutes to two hours. And they had to do this, uh, you know, eight to 10 times a day, three to four times in the middle of the night. And it was very, very critical that they didn't miss a feeding or Jonah could go into these hypoglycemic episodes. Um, and, you know, one of the things, uh, the reason they found that cornstarch worked for these kids is because it was metabolized a little bit differently. So it was able to to bypass some of the issues that, that they were facing. But the reality is because it was a very regimented uh, feeding schedule, you know, it was an extremely stressful life for his parents and for the families of other kids that have this condition. And it's a very rare condition, only affects about 5,000 kids in the country. So it wasn't, wasn't a lot of funding, wasn't a lot of research being done on uh, this condition. And so for Jonah's family, you know, there, there's actually a, a documentary on, on YouTube called Life by the Clock. They, they literally were living a life by the clock, having to set multiple alarm clocks, wake up in the middle of the night to make sure they didn't miss a feeding. Um, so they were very proactive. You know, he was born in, in 2000 and, and uh, right around then his family started a foundation and they knew that in their lifetime, there was not going to be a cure for this condition. So they were really looking at, at different types of nutrition therapies that at least alleviate the stress on their lives, alleviate the stress for Jonah and, and, you know, be able to provide him with something at least at night that would allow him to maintain that steady blood sugar level, steady energy level and sleep throughout the night. And ultimately, this is where the super starch was discovered. So for eight years, uh, some of the top carbohydrate researchers in the world, um, in Scotland, they were looking at all different types of grains, different types of starches, uh, tapioca, barley, wheats, and eventually they found that starting with a non-GMO cornstarch and putting it through a very specific cooking process just involving heat, water, and pressure over an extended period of time actually significantly changed the structure of the, of the carbohydrate of the, of the cornstarch and caused it to break down much more slowly and steadily over time. So a lot of people hear cornstarch and you know they, they say, isn't, isn't corn high glycemic? Doesn't it enter... Uh, your system very quickly. And so what's really key to understand is, is that that's all absolutely true. But the way this non-GMO cornstarch is cooked actually changes all of that very significantly. It, it, it creates a much longer chain carbohydrate and it causes it to break down very slowly and steadily. So, uh, you know, starting in 2008, when the super starch became available, Jonah was able to take in a large amount of it prior to sleeping at night. And it actually broke down very slowly trickled into the system very slowly and was that he was able to maintain that steady blood sugar level for eight hours. Now he was taking in quite a large dose, about uh, 90 to 100 grams of this super starch at once, but taking all that in at once uh, really allowed him to maintain that steady blood sugar level. So he was able 
to sleep throughout the night. So this was a major, major discovery, uh, you know, for the family, really life changing uh, for his parents, for his family, being able to, to give this to him and keep his energy steady so he could sleep throughout the night. Uh, but, you know, we started wondering what else could this carbohydrate be used for? You know, what impact would it have on, on athletes? What impact would it have just on general folks? Um, without this condition, without this glycogen storage disease. Um, so we'll get to that in a moment, but I should just reiterate that uh, the, the cornstarch that it's used is non-GMO. Cooking process is completely natural, no chemicals, no enzymes. And we at UCAN, uh, we do have the worldwide patent on this cooking technology. So this is not something that, that just anybody can do. This is a very specific process that's applied to this non-GMO cornstarch. And it's really though the way it's cooked that makes it different than just going to the grocery store and buying regular cornstarch at the grocery store. And then finally, it, it is gluten free as well. So the super starch carbohydrate, it is uh, gluten free. So as we were starting to wonder, you know, because as Greg's talked about, and we've kind of identified, we all want to manage our glucose levels, whether it's for athletic performance, you know, even if we don't have this condition, whether it's for athletic performance, whether it's just to manage our energy throughout the day, um, you know, whether it's to prevent blood sugar swings that can lead to certain conditions like prediabetes or, or metabolic syndrome. If we can maintain that steady blood sugar level, it's going to be extremely beneficial for both health and athletic performance. Uh, and so as we were looking in 2008, 2009, um, you know, at other applications of the super starch carbohydrate, we started reaching out to various dietitians and nutritionists and the feedback from all of them was, you know, very promising, at least on the theory behind this. Now, they all said you need to put some clinical research behind this, which we ultimately did. That was the blood sugar graph that we looked at a couple slides ago where we, where we tested our, our carbohydrate against maltodextrin in a, in a clinical trial at the University of Oklahoma. But theoretically, a lot of people were telling us this has a lot of promise. You know, this is very unique. Most of the sports nutrition products are designed to give you that quick burst of energy, this is coming at it from a different way. And, and one of the first athletes to, to utilize UCAN before we even had a product was Med Kaflesky, who uh, at age 41 is about to run his fourth, uh, or is about to uh, compete in the Olympics for the fourth time in his just incredible running career. Um, he'll be running on, on Sunday. And, and back in 2009, um, as he was training for the New York City Marathon, which he actually won that year, Meb started playing around with UCAN in his training. And at that time, his nutritionist, uh, a woman by the name of Dr. Krista Austin, had told us that as Meb was getting older, he too was struggling with a lot of the, the factors that Greg has identified in terms of fueling. You know, he was struggling with the, the GI issues from the simple carbohydrates um, in terms of mid-run fueling. So Meb's nutritionist, uh, Krista, you know, liked the idea that this was something, this UCAN with super starch in it was something that Meb could load up on prior to going out for a training run and it would just keep the blood sugar level and the energy level very steady and very even over an extended period of time. And, and since then, you know, he's been implementing UCAN in, in a variety of ways into his training. Uh, he relies on it from a recovery standpoint. He relies on it to help keep him lean, but we won't get into too much of all of that, but just, um, you know, kind of wanted to illustrate that this is where it all started with, with, you know, first with Jonah and then with Mev. And then finally in 2010 at the Boston Marathon, that's when we uh, launched our UCAN products and that's when they became commercially available. And, you know, just been remarkable, uh, kind of the number of people that have taken to it since then, uh, both from the top athlete standpoints, the, the top coaches like Greg, uh, as well as, you know, a wide range of, of age groupers, Boston Marathon qualifiers, first time runners, runners, you know, both looking to, to improve their performance, but also looking to get lean. There, there's really been a lot of different applications and a lot of different ways that people have found to incorporate UCAN into their training. But we want to really stay focused uh, for the purpose of this webinar on the application of UCAN for marathon and half marathon training or, or for distance running. Um, so let's take a, a little bit of a few minutes to talk through the different UCAN products. Uh, we'll bring Greg back in here and, and talk specifically about how to implement this in your training and on race day. So there's essentially four different types of UCAN products. And I'm going to start with, you know, what we simply call the UCAN, which is our, our powdered drink mix that features the super starch carbohydrate, which is, again, the key ingredient in UCAN. That's the energy source. So we don't use sugars. There's no sugar in UCAN. It's all the energy, all the carbohydrate is coming from the super starch. 
depending on the serving size, whether you're going to get it in bulk in a tub or whether you're going to get it as a single serve packet, the serving size ranges from 80 to 130 calories per serving. The way you really want to think about UCAN is not as a sports drink that you sip on slowly as you're running. It's, it's not a traditional sports drink in any way. This is really a pre-exercise snack. I tell people this is liquid food that you're drinking prior to your run. It's very easy on your stomach, so it doesn't sit heavy. And if you consume it prior to your run, then once you start exercising, it's just going to break down very slowly and steadily over time and maintain that steady and even blood sugar level. Um, generally speaking, people find that the packet, which is roughly that 130 calorie serving, lasts them about 90 minutes to two hours once they start exercising. Whereas a tub, which is uh, a scoop, excuse me, which is roughly that 80 calorie serving, is good for about an hour once you start exercising. So one of the really unique things about UCAN is, you know, like Greg mentioned, that what he likes about it uh, in part is that you don't have to fuel as frequently and you don't have to take in as much. And, and that's really twofold. It's A, because the carbohydrate is much more of a slower and steady release. So you're not getting all the calories very quickly. You're getting them at a much more controlled rate. And number two is that when you don't spike your blood sugar, your body's better able to tap into and metabolize fat. So a big issue that happens with a lot of runners is they're so uh, sugar dependent that you're not really allowing your body to optimize its ability to burn fat, which is, you know, a key to having success in the marathon. So, you know, when you're taking in that banana or that bagel or that, that energy gel and you're spiking your blood sugar right before you go out there and exercise, your body's really saying, I have all this sugar in my blood. Let me burn that sugar first before I burn fat. And then, you know, throughout the duration of your exercise, if you're constantly putting your body through those blood sugar swings and you're sucking in, uh, sucking down a gel every 30 minutes, again, you're not letting your body reach that optimal fat burning state. And, and this is something that, you know, there's certain workouts in terms of, you know, that steady state long run that can improve your body's ability to burn fat. But from a nutritional standpoint, you know, what you do in terms of fueling during training is also significantly going to impact your body's ability to burn fat. So if in training, you're somebody that's pounding the sugars and, and really relying on a lot of these quick energy sources, then you're not going to allow your body in that training period to improve your fat burning ability. That's where we really, really view you can as an extremely valuable training tool that both allows you to maintain steady energy levels by providing you with that steady release of carbohydrate, but it's doing that without negatively impacting your ability to burn fat. So the you can drink mix, it comes in a variety of flavors. It's a, it's a little bit starchy undoubtedly in texture. So we do recommend uh, mixing it up with cold water, giving it a good hard shake if you have a shaker bottle or even popping it in the blender at home if that's convenient. Um, but it isn't something that's going to dissolve in water. You do want to give it a good hard shake and you want to consume it about 30 minutes prior to your run. Now, this same product uh, can also be consumed during your run. And, and we'll have another slide in a, in a couple minutes here that'll, that'll really walk you through the exact protocol that we recommend both uh, whether it's in training or um, you know, whether it's uh, on race day, but uh, the same you can drink mix can be used both pre run as well as during your run. Then we've got the you can with protein. So, this again is the same premise. It's got the super starch in it that's going to keep your blood sugar and your energy steady. Um, and then it's got added protein as well to allow your body to repair and rebuild your muscles. So, this is something that a lot of people, uh, and Meb specifically, uses this after almost every hard workout from a recovery standpoint. And, and what we see being the benefit of the you can with protein and, and having the, the, the super starch as your post-workout carbohydrate is that it's going to allow you to maintain that steady blood sugar and steady energy level post-workout. So a lot of times, you know, you get done with a long run and you might not have the luxury of sitting down for a, a well-balanced meal right away. Getting this, the carbohydrate in the form of super starch after a run is really going to keep the blood sugar and energy level steady so you don't experience that post-workout crash. Uh, Greg, I know this is something that, that you've really relied on um, in a big way uh, throughout a variety of your training. Can you just speak to kind of um, your rationale behind using the UCAN with protein um, as your recovery shake? Yeah, there's been some research. In fact, it, it occurred a while back that was showing if you ingest some carbohydrates with a little protein within the first 30 minutes after f finishing a hard workout or long workout, 
the enzyme that uh, restores or replenishes those carbohydrate stores that you've burned is ramped up 300 percent. So you take advantage of that by putting uh, you know something in your body quickly but a lot of times you don't want to eat a meal right after so I think having a shake or something is really good because you get you take advantage of that what they call the glycogen window uh, and then it also satiates you just enough that when you get home you're typically not gonna you know ravage the pantry for all the stuff you shouldn't be eating you take your time you prepare a more proper meal so I find my my actually nutrition is so much better just because I'm not so hungry after runs uh, when I get home. So taking that I think right after is is really beneficial for those two kind of things. And you're going to hear, you know, you've probably heard me already say it time and time again, but a lot of what Greg's talking about really comes back to that ability to stabilize blood sugar. So where this is different than a lot of your carb protein drinks, whether it's, you know, something like chocolate milk that might have 20 or 25 grams of sugar, or even a, you know, a carb protein drink with 20 grams of maltodextrin is that the super starch is really what's contributing to helping you curb that post-workout hunger because it's keeping your blood sugar level steady. You know, a lot of times um, people, I, we've heard this time and time again, where, you, you know, you pound that chocolate milk after a workout and then 45 minutes later, you're starving because your body's gone through that sugar spike. Um, there's actually some interesting research um, that for women specifically that consuming a high glycemic carbohydrate immediately in the post-workout window can have um, extreme negative impacts in terms of your ability to continue burning fat in the post-workout period. So for those that are focused on body composition and training, uh, another big benefit of this you can with protein, and this is something that Mebsine, um, you know, to a great degree as he's gotten older, is that by keeping your blood sugar steady and keeping that hormone insulin low, that insulin is a hormone that every time you get a sugar spike, your body will produce insulin, but it's, it's a storage hormone and it's basically helping you get that excess sugar out of your bloodstream and, and it's storing it away as fat. So you're able to better burn fat when your insulin's low and, and the super starch by releasing slowly and steadily and not spiking your sugars, it doesn't cause an insulin response. So it's allowing your body in that post-workout period to continue burning fat. But this product is something that can also be used pre-run as well. So because it has the super starch in it, we find that some folks, um, you know, if they're going out for a long run and don't want to eat much breakfast, um, people have had success having the you can with protein 30 to 60 minutes prior to a run as well and, and really using that as a uh, breakfast or a pre-exercise snack and a, having a little bit of protein in there will help curb some of that hunger that you might feel, um, you know, 35, uh, 45 minutes or an hour into your run. Um, and then we've got the you can snack bar. So these are also another product with the super starch in it, um, you know, conceptually similar to the powders just in bar form. Uh, they've also got some added protein, fiber, and fat that'll curb hunger. Um, they're, they're very low in sugar uh, compared to a lot of the other energy bars on the market. So five to six grams of sugar per bar, which is you know a fraction of what you'll see in uh, your common uh, mainstream uh, energy bars that people typically have. And again, the key here is the super starch. That's the primary carbohydrate source in this bar, and that's what's keeping your blood sugar and energy steady. So this is something that you can also use, you know, pre-workout, um, pre-run as, as a substitute to the powders. Uh, we generally find that the bars are, are going to last folks about 60, uh, 60 to 75 minutes uh, in terms of keeping your energy steady for that period of time. Now, it does have some protein in it, about 46 grams, depending on the flavor. Um, so you can use it post-workout to, to curb some of that post-workout hunger and, again, keep your blood sugar level steady. But we would put this more in uh, energy bar, a steady energy bar category than we do a protein bar. This is not a 20 gram protein muscle building meal replacement bar, but it is a great snack option, either pre-workout or post-workout. Then the final uh, product we'll talk about, and then we'll uh, drill down on um, just some specifics on how to use this in your training, um, is the UCAN Hydrate. So the UCAN drink mixes all do contain electrolytes, both sodium and potassium, similar quantities to what you'd find in a typical gel product. But the UCAN Hydrate, um, this is our only product without the super starch in it. So this is a, a zero calorie electrolyte replacement with no sugar. It's got a higher concentration of sodium and potassium, and it also has a, a good amount of magnesium, 50 milligrams per serving. And, and magnesium it, it is actually uh, an electrolyte that a lot of uh, folks are deficient in, especially athletes. So we have double the magnesium in this product compared to a lot of um, electrolyte products out there on the market. So this is something that, again, this is not going to give you energy. This is for hydration. This is to prevent cramping. Uh, this is something that you can sip on 
in between your doses of the you can fuel and, and with the you can hydrate product you know depending on your own sweat level uh, depending on where you're training or racing and, and you know the, the weather conditions and the heat and all of that um, you know this is something that some folks find necessary to supplement with the you can fuel uh, or others find that the electrolytes in the you can drink mixes with the superstars they find that the electrolytes in those products are sufficient for them so with all of this you know you just want to play around with it in your training and and see what works best for you. So, uh, Greg, yeah, you, you, I'll bring you back in here. Um, let's talk personally for you as we look at the before and the during application of UCAN. What for you um, has personally worked well, and what are you hearing from your runners that has worked well in terms of fueling with UCAN for these marathon type workouts or races? I think what the big paradigm shift, and you mentioned it before, is that. You can is not a sports drink like a traditional sports drink. So you're not supposed to take it every 15 to 20 minutes like you would normal, you know, a normal sports drink. It's really more like a food. And so what people are finding, this is certainly what I find, is that one serving every hour uh, really works well for marathon type long runs and certainly the race itself. And that's so nice because what it means is that you only have to add in the carbohydrate once every hour. And then anything you do in between is just really hydration and electrolytes. So you're not really slamming a lot of fast acting sugars into your body every 15 minutes or so with a sports drink or 30 to 45 minutes with a gel. So for myself, I like one serving every hour. Uh, a little bit before, so you have 30 minutes before, have a serving, and then at the one hour mark, the two hour mark, even three hour mark if I were going longer, uh, really, boy, it keeps my stomach happy and keeps my energy level steady, and that's been kind of consistent across the board. Again, everybody's a little bit unique, so you have to play around, but that's a good starting point is take a serving, 30, 45 minutes before you start a workout, and then once every hour uh, along the way is a great way to do it. And Greg, I often tend to do do this, you know, sometimes bury uh, the most, uh, kind of what a lot of runners find to be the most significant thing about you can, but what you just mentioned in terms of keeping your stomach happy, I mean, that's that, like Greg told us, you know, for a lot of runners, that's the biggest thing that can sabotage you know months of great training and and can sabotage a, a race and can be very frustrating and so that's really one of the biggest things we're hearing about you can because of uh you know it's twofold because you're not taking in as much and fueling as frequently there's simply less going into your stomach that could potentially bother it but the other uh point kind of from a structural standpoint is the super starch it's an extremely long chain carbohydrate it's a very very complex molecule and and Essentially, what that means is it's going to bypass and get out of your stomach very, very quickly. So the, the best way I can describe it is, you know, a few minutes after you drink it, um, while the texture is a little bit thicker, you're just not really going to even feel it in your stomach. It almost disappears. So that's really what runners have gravitated to you can for. You know, it, it gives you that energy, but it still allows you to feel light. And, and that's, a, that's a huge, huge point that Greg raised. Um, we had a question from Peter that Greg just really touched on, but, uh, you know, Peter, you asked, why is it recommended to drink you can all at once, um, versus sipping it. And, and Greg, I know actually initially before, you know, we, we were really working together and, and you were still, um, you know, experimenting and using you can, you were actually kind of sipping it at first, right? That that's what you'd done when you ran the Boston marathon with you can a few years ago. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't you initially sipping it? And more recently you've kind of changed the way you've been using it. Yeah, I started with with kind of using it in the traditional way, uh, like a sports drink, uh, and that was okay. But I actually found it's a little bit better um, to spread out the feedings. Uh, certainly more convenient to do that. It's a simpler nutrition strategy. Uh, but to mix a packet in eight ounces of water or something like that and take that every hour is very very doable. I found that. That strategy within the in-between where I would be just having water and electrolytes seemed to, to work the best for me. Again, everybody has to experiment, but I'm just going for the least complicated nutrition strategy. And that to me is once every hour 
and then water and electrolytes in between. And what we're finding with our athletes is there is some variation, but that's a great place to start uh, out, and then you can begin to adjust from there. And in terms of the variation Greg speaks of, um, you know, and, and actually just take one step back. So, you know, one of the other things that Greg said in terms of sipping versus having it all at once, if you think about you can as a food rather than a sports drink, then that'll really, you know, maybe lend some clarity around why you kind of want to consume it over a relatively short period of time. We're not saying you have to chug it in 10 seconds. You know, a lot of people are drinking a serving every hour, say over the course of a mile or over the course of, you know, five minutes. So, um, you know, you have a little bit of leeway there, but it's really, you know, the way the carbohydrate works because it's not a sugar that's giving you that quick burst of energy, kind of the, the theory behind sipping on a sugar-based drink is that, you know, by constantly sipping on it, you're keeping the blood sugar level steady because you're getting that, you know, kind of that constant burst, that constant burst, but it requires you to be drinking and, and you know, consuming that throughout the entire time. And if you get behind, um, it can be trouble. So with UCAN, you know, because of the way it breaks down slowly, where people really do have the most success um, is consuming a serving, you know, over a relatively short period of time and then spacing it out um, in the appropriate intervals, you know, an hour if it's, if it's a scoop. Um, and, and that's the, the versatile thing about you can, as you see on this chart, you know, if you're somebody that tolerates taking in more at once well, then we have people, you know, doing the same type of thing that we're talking about here, but rather than that, that scoop size serving, which is, you know, that roughly 80 calorie serving every hour, we have others that are taking a little bit larger of a serving and taking that packet, you know, which is about that 130 calorie serving. And they're doing that every 90 minutes, you know, that there's other folks that are going to take in two scoops at once. So they'll take in two scoops before they start. And then every two hours, they'll take in another two scoops. And what we've really seen is that this same protocol, whether you're running a four hour marathon or a six hour marathon, you know, that scoop an hour or that packet every 90 minutes uh, seems to, at a general level, work for people regardless of the time that they're out there. And, and of course, the importance of practicing this in training is to figure out and to dial in exactly how much you need to take and at what intervals you should space it out. You know, you can absolutely adjust this up and up or down. So you could do, you know, if you were somebody that just felt like you needed it, or, or if you're a very high carbohydrate burner, um, at, at least initially starting out, you might want to do a scoop every 45 minutes. Similarly, if you've trained your body to be very efficient at burning fat, you might say, hey, for me, a scoop lasts 90 minutes. So there's a little bit of playing around with this in training. Now, Jim asks a question, which I know is probably on many people's mind. He says, how many fluid ounces are in one serving to go along with one serving at a time? And I actually want to skip to this slide. Uh, that's one of the beauties of UCAN. So the amount of fluid you mix a serving with has no bearing on how the product works or how the product digests. So this, again, is a little bit of a paradigm shift. You know, a lot of runners with these sugar-based products, you're used to having to mix it if it's a powder with a certain amount of fluid to, because of the way it impacts digestion. Or if you're uh, you know, consuming a gel, you, you kind of know that I'm supposed to chase it with this amount of water to help it digest. But with the super starch, it's going to digest the same whether it's mixed with you know, 16 ounces of fluid or two ounces of fluid. So you really want to think of the amount of UCAN you're taking really in terms of the amount of the powder, not in terms of the amount of fluid. A lot of people that are consuming UCAN during their training or during a race, they're actually mixing it up very thick and almost making their own gel, mixing up a serving with two to three ounces of water, you know, as you can see here in this image, giving it a good, good stir with a, a fork and then either carrying it in some type of soft flask or, or maybe a fuel belt bottle or, you know, even getting creative and putting it in a Ziploc baggie so you can just bite the corner off and squeeze it into your mouth like a gel. So. That's one of the nice things about UCAN. When we're talking about a serving every hour, we're not telling you you have to drink 12 ounces of water every hour. You know, you can really get that UCAN to be as thick as you can tolerate it in terms of consistency. And then in between your servings of UCAN, that's where you can worry about your hydration and sip on your fluids. Um, and then just in terms of uh, those getting started with UCAN, you know, one of the big things is that, again, this is a, a different type of carbohydrate. And this is something where, you know, the fueling guidelines and the fueling protocols for UCAN, they're still evolving, right? This hasn't been around for years and years and years where, uh, you know, where there's like these well-defined, um, you know, extremely established fueling protocols. But 
what I do caution uh, you from from doing is really don't try to apply traditional carbohydrate recommendations to UCAN because it's a different type of carbohydrate. It works differently. It breaks down differently. So uh, the chart on the uh, screen kind of illustrates this. You know, for a lot of people, say for a 90 minute long run, they're having 130 calorie serving of UCAN prior to their run and then just sipping on water, not needing to take in additional fuel during that run. You know, similarly, if you were going with the traditional fueling protocol, you know, you might have some type of energy bar uh, and then sip on a sports drink, which would get you up to about 300 calories uh, pre and during that run. Or if you're following the traditional gel recommendations, you might do a gel before, then a gel every 30 minutes, three gels, 300 calories during that run. So that's the thing with you, Ken, you know, we're able to consume less of it because as I, I read from the quote at the bottom of this slide from Dr. Kathy Echo, she's a, a metabolic researcher at Yale University, she says it's really the ability to maintain blood sugar that sustains energy levels. So from a fitness standpoint, UCAN is huge because it does that without, of putting, without putting lots of calories on board. It's really beneficial because you can make every calorie count. So I think I said this uh, a little bit earlier, but to reiterate, you know, with this super starch, it's both releasing very slowly and because of the way it releases, it's allowing you to metabolize and utilize more of your stored body fat for fuel. And, and we all have exponentially more stored fat than we do stored carbohydrate. We can only store a finite amount of carbohydrate. Uh, even somebody like Meb, who's very, very lean, has you know tens of thousands, uh, 10,000 uh, calories of stored fat in terms of body fat that he can access and utilize for fuel. So UCAN is really encouraging you by the way the carbohydrate releases to be able to use a better mix of fuels, uh, which is why you know it's not that you're depriving yourself or, or taking in less just for the sake of taking in less. You just simply don't need to take in as much to maintain those steady energy levels. Uh, Greg, has that lived up to what you've experienced with UCAN in terms of when you've been doing these longer runs? Do you find that you're able to get by with less than what you were perhaps doing previously? Yes, I think that that, and again, that's another paradigm shift because so much of the fueling recommendation has been on a number of calories per hour, but I think you make a very good point that when you have a different type of carbohydrate, then that it really those numbers don't work anymore. And so ultimately, I think it just comes down to the scoop, <laughs> the scoop or the pouch. Whatever you need, uh, one per hour seems to work for most people, and that'll be significantly less calories. But I think that those calories you're taking in, those 300 calories, they're not all being used to fuel your performance. So it's it's not it doesn't work exactly that way. So you, you, you shouldn't just follow those recommendations with this product. Again, I think it's its own thing, and uh, I have not experienced any reduced amount of energy by using UCAN. Conversely, I've actually felt better doing it and felt like I had more steady energy the whole time. So um, I don't think you can use that traditional model of X number of calories per hour is required. And you know, I, I, it's like it's like you did it when you first got your hand on the product. You just said, "Let me, let me, tag, go out there, do some training runs, and and put it to the test." And that's kind of what we encourage folks to do to figure out how to best space out uh, the doses. Um, I'll just add a, one or two more points before we wrap this up. We have a, a few people asking, kind of just about logistically mixing it up and carrying it on on the race course. So you can absolutely mix this up, you know, up to 48 hours in advance. So I don't recommend trying to, you know, play around with this while you're running and mix it up on course. The, the powder's fluffy. It's, you know, it's going to get kind of get all over you. You're not going to be very happy. So definitely, you know, pre-mix it, pre-prepare it the night before, and then, um, you know, transfer it into your, your bottles, whether it's a fuel belt or a gel flask or, or a water bottle. And, you know, many people, if you don't want to carry multiple bottles, um, and, and you're, you're running with a handheld, uh, but when we talked about mixing it up thicker, you can concentrate several servings, you know, so you can get many hours of nutrition in just one bottle. And then if you run by the aid stations and, and you, you know, you can just worry about grabbing water. And, you know, in terms of carrying it with you, I know uh, we have a few people saying, what if you're not an elite, you know, how do you carry this with you? Do you have to have someone hand it with you, uh, hand it to you? Greg, you kind of recommend um, almost th that all of your runners carry their own fuel and, and hydration, don't you? Absolutely. There's there's so many great 
uh, hydration packs these days that you can always find one that works perfectly for you and I think it just again it reduces the issues during races I mean if you run big races the water stops are like it's like a traffic jam and you're so worried about trying to get in and you splash half of it all over you I say just carry it you can mix it up ahead of time you can drink exactly what you want to drink on your schedule and there's so many great packs now that you can easily have on board exactly what you need and um, I just think it makes everything easier and easier means that you can focus more on pushing when you get tired. So that's kind of the uh, pre and during aspect of UCAN. We'll just run through this quickly. Afterwards, we already talked about why Greg likes the UCAN with protein after exercise. So that uh, can absolutely be used from a recovery standpoint, also to, to just keep your blood sugar and energy steady so you don't have that post-workout crash. Same deal with the UCAN snack bars. Again, because of it, it's not a, a very high amount of protein, you know, think of this more as something to curb hunger and keep your energy steady. And then you can get an additional protein, you know, when you sit down to have your meal in terms of, uh, in terms of real food. Um, and then the UCAN hydrate, the electrolyte product, you can certainly drink that after exercise to, to rehydrate without sugar. I um, mean, then the everyday use application, you know, we, we won't talk too much about this. This is probably a actually did a great webinar with Greg and, and Kathy Echo, who I alluded to um, back in January, kind of talking about, um, you know, nutrition and, and the application of, of UCAN kind of outside of the, the training period uh, from a weight loss standpoint. But this is, again, something because it doesn't have the sugars in it, this is not just a marathon training product. This is something that especially the UCAN with protein or the UCAN bars that people are, are implementing as part of, of meal replacement shakes, blending it with healthy fats and other protein, um, you know, to create a more complete meal replacement shake and, and that you can really contribute again by keeping your blood sugar and keeping your energy steady, which can help you curb hunger. And, and Greg, without taking too much longer, I know uh, you've had some success. Just maybe you can speak to that briefly with the you can with protein from a weight loss standpoint, haven't you? Yeah, I wanted to uh, get a little bit leaner last fall as I was getting ready for a race series and was able to use it as a meal replacement. It was my lunch meal replacement uh, and it satiated you know, my hunger but I was getting fewer calories in and I was able to lose the weight that I wanted to lose without sort of starving myself or being grumpy around my family <laughs> and so I think it's a really great meal replacement uh, as well that uh, you know you get it just satiates you and keeps your blood sugar steady so you're not hungry and kind of buys you time in between meals. I know Meb does that a lot too. That's a big part of his use of you can is to stay lean by uh, making sure he's not um, not over consuming. Absolutely. And, you know, especially when he's traveling kind of outside of the training window, when he's traveling and doing a lot of appearances, he'll very often rely on that you can with protein shake in the afternoon just to tide him over until his next meal. And we've seen a lot of people using it that way. So, you know, really in summary, super starch is what's unique about UCAN. It's a different type of carbohydrate. Um, UCAN has different fueling protocols and, and certainly, um, you know, you guys have an opportunity to, to reach out to me after this webinar and, uh, and I'm happy to, to talk you through it um, as well. And, and I'll be sending this out as a recording so everyone can review. And, and just one final point I want to make is that, you know, UCAN and super starch is still a carbohydrate. So when we're talking about burning fat, you know, this is not, we're not talking about a ketogenic diet or anything like that. I mean, you are still getting carbohydrate from UCAN. We're just providing you with carbohydrate at a more optimal rate where your body can better utilize fat. So that's, that's a big thing that I just want to make sure I, I saw one question from uh, somebody asking about, you know, ketoacidosis with UCAN, but, but, you know, that's really not, not a concern. This is providing you with glucose and carbohydrate at a very steady rate and it's allowing your body to also utilize fat and do what it wants to do during exercise, which is burn fat. Um, so Greg, this is, uh, you know, we've, we've covered a lot. We've, we've gone a long way. I know a lot of folks will probably use this as a reference point as they're training for their fall marathon um, to, to look back on a lot of the wisdom that you shared with us in the beginning. And for those interested in UCAN, um, you know, the second half of this webinar will hopefully provide you with a pretty comprehensive look at how to use the product in training. Um, but Greg, if people want to get more involved with you, uh, take advantage of 
you know, some of the education, your run club, uh, how can folks interact more with Macmillan running and, uh, and kind of get more on board with your training philosophies? Well, it's pretty easy. Just go to the website, macmillanrunning.com. We've got our whole list of training and coaching services there uh, that you can take advantage of. There's obviously a contact page, so if you want to send an email, um, have ask specific questions, feel free to do that. We've got a variety of different services. We can build you a training plan. We offer personal coaching. We've got online training community. We've got lots of different things. So I welcome you to ask questions of me and uh, if I can help you in any way, just let me know. Awesome, Greg. And uh, I will be sending out a link to uh, the Macmillan Running uh, website and also how to get involved with the Macmillan Run Club specifically, which you see on the screen. But um, as you can see, a lot of great options uh, at MacmillanRunning.com. And Greg is, uh, you know, has tons and tons of experience coaching all different types of athletes. So um, a lot of things that you can uh, do uh, with Greg to help you improve your own running. But with that, Greg, I just want to thank you again for your time. It's always, uh, always fun doing this with you. Always fun um, hearing your insight. And I think uh, based on the comments I'm seeing, a lot of people found this to be extremely valuable. So thank you so much, Greg, for the time. Really appreciate the knowledge. Um, and for everybody who signed up and joined us, we really appreciate your interest. I know that, you know, for a lot of you, it's kind of getting into the heart of, or, or maybe just the beginning, depending on what race you're training for, or kind of the meat of your marathon training program. So hopefully we were able to give you some helpful information, both from the training and from the nutrition side of things. Uh, stay tuned in the next hour or two, you will be receiving a full copy of this by email with some additional information and a couple special offers. Um, but until then, we just appreciate everyone's time. And thanks again, Greg. Appreciate your time as well. Yep. Take care. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you.